Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Uh, as this, uh, as your preparation began, a reporter asked a simple question about what lessons were learned from Puerto Rico. Sure. Uh, and the president um, went off and sort of didn't accept the premise that there were lessons to be learned from Puerto Rico. Were there lessons to be learned from Puerto Rico for you, sir? Yeah, I, I don't believe the president. I think the, the president is being taken out of context there. I mean, I talk to the president every day this week and, um, and, and the Secretary of Homeland Security. We, we, we discuss uh, what we're trying to do as a result of last year. He's well aware of that. And, and the thing about Puerto Rico is, is that disaster response and recovery, is it's a whole community team effort. You have to have anybody from neighbor helping neighbor like the Cajun Navy all the way up to the federal government response. Um, and, and I always say that emergency management is like a, a chair with four legs. One leg represents the federal government, the other leg represents the state and local government, the third leg re represents the private sector and NGOs, and the private sector owns 85% of the infrastructure in this country, uh, and then the fourth leg is, is you, the citizen. So anytime that there is one leg missing going so into leg, a response to recovery. Which leg was yeah. missing in Puerto Rico? Well, you know, let's face it, uh, you know, FEMA, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, FEMA was the first responder and the only responder for many weeks going into Puerto Rico. So here's what we're doing to change that. We're working with Governor Rose say, yo, he, like me, just came into his job, right. you know, and gets hit with one of the most complex disasters. I work with Governor Rosselló and his staff every day to say, hey, how do we build a stronger emergency management capability in the Commonwealth and at the 78 municipality level? And not only, you know, have we hired eight FEMA is now one of the largest employers in Puerto Rico. I got the best of what Puerto Rico's got to offer. I've got teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers that are now part of FEMA helping the, the yeah. Commonwealth to design a, a more viable and economic future going forward. The president has been disputing the death toll, multiple tweets. Um, he said over many months it went to 64 people, then like magic, 3,000 people killed. Believe it or not, Mr. Mr. Long, the White House put out a five-page backgrounder citing other death toll numbers that were less than the one that the governor of Puerto Rico has accepted. 2,975 people died uh, as a result of Hurricane Maria or impact from Hurricane Maria, according to the Puerto Rican government. Does FEMA accept that number? So <laughs> the numbers are all over the place. FEMA doesn't count deaths. Um, and, and like if you, if you take what's going on with Florence, the deaths that are verified by the local county coroners are the ones that we take. Now, what we do offer are funeral benefits um, after a disaster uh, for, for those that are eligible. And so those are some of the numbers that you can put forward that can be cross-referenced with any of the numbers that are out there. Um, but here's the thing. You know, these guys are so dedicated. They work around the clock. One death is a death too many. But the why, is, why, know, does the, why, why does it matter? Why is the White House so concerned about the difference between 3,000 deaths and say another report that might have had it at, at 1,800 deaths. I mean, you've said yourself it doesn't matter, but the White House believes it matters. Why? Well, I'll tell you this. You know, one thing about President Trump is is that he uh, is probably the one president that has had more support for what goes on back here. And I think he's defensive because he knows how hard these guys behind me work day in and day out for a very complex situation. And it's frustrating. Those studies, the Harvard study was done differently than the George Washington study or this study or that study. And the numbers are all over the place. And, and where the 65... Hold on, hold on. Is it fair? I mean, he said Democrats did it to make them look... Do you believe any of these studies were done to make the president look bad? Well, I mean, there's... there's uh, 
I, I don't think the studies, I don't know why the studies were done. I mean, I think what we're trying to do, in my opinion, uh, what we've got to do is figure out why people die from direct deaths, which is the wind, the water, and the waves, uh, you know, buildings collapsing, which is probably where the 65 number came from. And then there's indirect deaths. So the George Washington study looked at what happened six months after the fact. And, you know, what happens is, and, and even in this event, you might see more deaths indirectly occur as time goes on because people have heart attacks due to stress. They fall off their house trying to fix their roof. They die in car crashes because they, they went through an intersection where the stoplights weren't working. You know, the other thing that goes on, there's all kinds of studies on this that we take a look at. Spousal abuse goes through the roof. You can't blame spousal abuse, you know, after a disaster on anybody. And the president's very passionate about the work we've done. He's been incredibly supportive supportive of me and the staff. He's actually, I bet he's probably the only president that's held two cabinet level meetings, brought his entire cabinet to this agency to show support. They come through this agency every okay. day. And he's, he's, he's very supportive, which is what exactly what FEMA needs. There's, a, there's a, just uh, too much blame going around and we need to be focused, Chuck, on what is Puerto okay. Rico going to look like tomorrow? It is Monday. The 17th of September of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays, because it's been one of those weekends, and Monday, hey, we gotta, we gotta kind of mash it all together, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, of course, uh, you know, well, we have a show curated for you today. And, and I'm trying to to pull stories from out in the world that might just slip by the wayside because of all the other stories that take precedent and and well they should. Um, of course, we know more about Kavanaugh. I suspected all of this, but it's uh, just interesting to you know acknowledge that I'm still batting 1,000 and have been since before Watergate. Okay. I you know which means I'm due for not not getting a home run. I'm due for one of those because I've been hitting them so many times over all these many decades. But uh, soon as as soon as Kavanaugh was going off about coaching girls, fifteen, mentoring them, I did mention I bet there's something in his past. I don't know if it's Roy Moore stuff, because, well, let's be clear, Kavanaugh went to a much more elitist prep school than Roy Moore ever did, all right? <laughs> so, and uh, uh, also I mentioned, you know, the salaciousness of Kavanaugh's questions uh, that he wrote up for Star to ask Clinton, I mean, <laughs> back in the day. When we came across these questions, we, we kind of nodded and winked at each other and said, boy, those Republicans are a kinky lot, aren't they? Yeah, creepy, too. And uh, the reason those questions are asked is because they probably have some experience. Uh huh. And, uh, of course, Kavanaugh's tweets, uh, or not tweets, but uh, his uh, uh, statements are like Trump's tweets. You know, there's always a tweet with Trump. You can uh, have an event happening today, and you can go back several years and look at Trump's tweets, and he'll have something that uh, is exact opposite of how he is speaking today. Or it, uh, it elucidates uh, something that we already know, right? Well, Kavanaugh's the same way. And uh, the the amount of effort that they would put in to bring down someone not because of really you know impropriety but simply because they were liberal democrats and they had to conjure something up a consensual sexual relationship okay consensual that was enough to get rid of a president or attempt to they impeached him of course, he didn't leave office. But think about that. A consensual sexual relationship will get you impeached. But forcible sexual abuse? Nah, that's a criteria for you to be a Republican. 
especially if the victim is young. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, Trump even is on record uh, coming on to a 12 or 13 year old saying, boy, in 10 years, I'm going to come after you. (sighs) All right. It's not as if none of us saw it coming is what I'm trying to say. And they're trying to rush this uh, nomination through, not because they want a sexual abuser, you know, on the court. That's just ancillary to the fact that this is, uh, you know, someone who uh, will, how shall I put it, politicize the court? <laughs> if it's not politicized already. Unbelievable. Yeah, packing the courts. And then they want they they want to keep it at nine. They you know or they, actually they could go less than nine. They want to go less than nine, and uh, because judges, I mean Trump even said judges. Have you heard of any other country in the world having judges? What a weirdo! <laughs> oh boy, the master race. It is the master race. What else do we have on the menu today? Of course, uh, Brock Long, the FEMA chief, is, was up there at the top on uh, uh, Meet the Press. Or Press the Meat, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> uh, basically giving Trump a pass on 3,000 deaths. All those are just numbers made up. You can look at any kind of study. And, and anyway, most people die from spousal abuse during natural disasters. Now, that's something I wasn't aware of. I mean, I could see how it could happen, the stress and everything. And next thing you know, uh, you just got to kill your spouse. Yep. Not having electricity setting you back 100 years. I mean, the first thing that comes to your mind is, I can't take this pressure. I got to kill the people I love. Maybe that's how they do it in that guy's family. Eee. Don't marry Don't marry Anne to the Long family. Something bad might happen if something bad happens. On the rest of the menu, in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, well, the Texas State Board of Education is at it again. They voted to remove Hillary Clinton and Helen Keller from its history curriculum, but Dolores Huerta will be included as a villain, ordering the lethal attacks on a modern-day Alamo. They're going to put Dolores Huerta in, but she gets to be a villain. Nice. State police accidentally revealed they are spying on progressives in a social media post about the Massachusetts gas explosions. Isn't that weird? You know, hundreds some odd houses blew up. Mom and her baby died from, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. That was the storm. Uh, a, a, a kid, a teenager died from uh, uh, debris falling on, on his car from one of the explosions. And uh, that just dropped off the radar. Pressure. Uh, High pressure bursts the pipes. Now, that could happen for any number of reasons, especially if you've deferred maintenance on those pipes for, you know, 40 or 50 years. But we do know that Duke Energy had been hacked by the Russians and other utilities around America. And many of these pressure tests are done digitally from the, you know, from the office. Uh Uh-huh. All right. Well, that's something to think about. And Peter Thiel says liberals are brainwashed by higher education. But that's because Peter Thiel is a vampire and needs the transfused blood of the ignorant to feed his vain attempt at eternal stupidity. Mm Mm-hmm. After the break, we'll then move to the chef's table where Devin Nunez can't seem to find time to campaign or meet his constituents, but he did have time to accept an award from a notorious anti-Muslim hate group. Uh Uh-huh. And the Border Patrol supervisor who just confessed to executing four women is the second Border Patrol agent from the Laredo sector to be accused of mass murder in just this year. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice to the right ish of the page the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And uh, do check in. Uh, she's there quite often, rather diligent in the way that she monitors that. So please do. A good way to engage us. Another way to engage us that helps us keep our lights on is by casting your eyes to the left ish of the page from the chat room link at netrootsradio.com is our contribute donate button and you can become a patreon to the cause of resistance radio and uh, your efforts in that is very much needed we're unable to do this without you folks all kidding aside and uh so every little bit helps there are some tiers that you can uh, uh choose to become a patreon by and get some uh, little trinket uh that you can get in the real world if you'd like or you can just uh, donate any sum of uh, your choosing. And that's all up to you. So thank you for your generosity on that. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. You can check us out over on Facebook. We got a Facebook Live thing going on, and we have to thank Kelly for that. Thank you, Kelly. And uh, oh, I should mention on our homepage also look, the election's coming up. Do not take it for granted that you are registered to vote. You could have been purged. Any number of things could happen. I have friends, and and I'm not Donald Trump saying this. I mean, I have friends, and I've read of other people in social media who have had this happen to them. They go to vote, and they're not on the rolls, and they have no idea how that happened. There is a link on our homepage as you first open it up. uh, And thank you, Tom. He's made a beautiful page for us. And it is seasonal, and we do change it. So uh, we've just uh, updated it for the voting season. (laughs) And uh, once again, there are links to check not only if you are registered to vote, but if by the off chance you have been kicked off the rolls or you have never voted before, there are also links in which you can, well, register to vote. You got 50 days. Okay. Hurry up. We need to have vast numbers, not just a small margin. They can only work the margins, and that's how they've won in these other times. Okay, you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I'm also uh, can be found on Daily Codes, where I post the show notes and links diary, a very integral part of the show. By the way, this is a multimedia operation. I can be found on Daily Codes as Justice Putnam. You can follow the uh, show on Facebook, and you can also follow us on Twitter, where we are uh, uh, known as at cookbook west just type in west coast cookbook and at cookbook west will come up and uh finally you can pick up podcasts of the show by way of spreaker stitcher tune in itunes uh youtube maybe iheart maybe one day i don't know we'll see and etc 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 okay First up on the menu here, the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is uh, an article out of Alternet by Matthew Chapman. According to a, a report in the Dallas Morning News, the Texas State Board of Education issued a preliminary vote to sharply cut back the so- social studies curriculum in the state. I mean, the less you know, Right. Education is just a way to brainwash people into being liberals. Isn't that weird? The more educated you become, the more critical thinking skills you achieve, the more reasoned thought you put into an effort somehow makes you liberal. Isn't that weird? Must be a conspiracy of nature. We got to change that. One major change is the elimination of required teaching about Hillary Clinton. As part of an effort to streamline the social studies curriculum in Texas, the State Board of Education voted to change what students in every grade are required to learn in the classroom. They approved the removal of several historical figures, including Hillary Clinton and Helen Keller. Helen Keller? Well, yeah. We don't want any, I don't know, damaged people having a say in our society. I mean, look at them. They're damaged. Hillary Clinton has been a significant figure in recent U.S. history, even before she became the first woman nominated for president by a major political party. 
She was also highly instrumental in both domestic legislation and foreign affairs as a first lady, senator, and secretary of state, advancing the cause of equal rights on the world stage, and shaping policy on everything from health care to family leave, to violence against women, to the cleanup of New York City after the 9-11 attacks. Which just proves what an evil witch she is, and she has to be brought down. These damn liberals and their do-good policies, it's all a smokescreen to change us into the evil devils that will consume our babies. For their part, the Texas Board of Education asserts that they are simply following the advice of the work group which ranked Clinton and other deleted historical figures against a rubric to determine whether they are essential to learning about history as part of an effort to ensure kids do not have to memorize too many names and dates. Curiously, however, this rubric gave perfect scores to local members of the Texas legislature. Of course they would. Additionally, the board is refusing to make several other changes to the curriculum recommended by experts for elimination, including the deletion of references to Judeo-Christian values and the alleged influence of Moses on the Declaration of Independence of the Constitution. Yeah, those were the tablets that got broken. He came down with, like, what, about 50 commandments, and he broke some tablets on the way down uh, off the mount. And he only had two left, and there was five on each. And they only had ten, ten commandments out of the 50-some. And those broken ones were uh, basically the writing of our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Moses! They believe this, folks. Uh, Apparently, my foray into seminary school brainwashed me into a different idea of how it all occurred. You know, sort of like a parable. Also recommended for deletion, but still kept in by the board, references to the heroism of defenders of the Alamo, which is problematic because those men were fighting in part for the right to practice slavery. And so instead, what they've done is that they've, well, included Dolores Huerta as basically backing Texans into a corner in which they have to fight for their lives, just like at the Alamo. Bob Brigham of Ross Story brings us his next offering here at the Bistro Cafe Pardo West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Ash Mondays. The Massachusetts State Police accidentally revealed surveillance of progressive political groups in a social media post on gas explosions in Lawrence, North Andover, and Andover. The police posted an image of 39 gas explosion locations but the screen grab of the police computer included the browser's bookmarks bar. That's where they always catch you. The post showed police and book pages for Massachusetts Action Against Police Brutality, the Coalition to Organize and Mobilize Boston Against Trump, and other activist organizations. Well, just like the S.A. Gestapo. Police were also monitoring a resistance calendar of anti-Trump protests. Cade Crockford, director of the Technology for Liberty program at the Massachusetts branch of the ACLU, slammed the revelation. I wasn't surprised, she said, but I was appalled. American law enforcement has, for a very long time, targeted dissidents. A lot of people like to believe those tactics ended, but that's not true. And actually, after 9-11, they've seen a substantial resurgence. Well, of course. (laughs) How else do you get put on a a no-fly list and you have no idea why, except maybe your political affiliation? Police in a statement said, said, such monitoring is a common and common sense function of any police department. Well, (laughs) really? Really? 
It is a common practice. Should it be a common practice? I don't know. Are they monitoring uh, the the uh, white supremacist groups? Well, they may, but only because they, they, they'd they like to show up and get some of the food and drink, too, that they have at those events. When you have Coast Guard members flashing the white power salute, you know, the little Pepe OK sign, <laughs> from a disaster crisis center, when you have cops flashing this sign in their... Uh, Ninja Turtle outfits and their Death Squad masks. What does it mean? of the San Francisco Chronicle brings us this last offering here at the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Teal says that Silicon Valley is not as liberal as it looks, and uh, those that are liberal were brainwashed by higher education. Yeah, Peter Teal said that. PayPal (laughs) co-founder. Yeah, PayPal. Uh Uh-huh. And venture capitalist Peter Thiel doesn't believe Silicon Valley is as liberal as people think it is, but one would never know it due to a left-wing conformity problem caused by higher education. Somehow, the more education you have, the more you think like everybody else. When asked where this conformity problem comes from, Thiel stated that it comes from institutions of higher education in America. Part of of it is it's probably the most educated part of the country in terms of how much time people spent in college, he said. I think one of the downsides of too much education is that you get brainwashed. Well, actually, brainwashing is a flimsy excuse to not take responsibility for one's actions. Okay. And critical thinkers, reasoned thinkers, really don't, uh, you know, think that the idea of brainwashing, uh, you know, confirmation bias. Yeah, that does exist. And once again, critical thinkers are aware of it. How much confirmation bias does Peter Thiel get to believe that if he transfuses the blood of young people, that he will live longer? He's a vampire. As a result of this, Teal believes that many of the rank-and-file members of Silicon Valley are not as liberal as people think. Well, of course not. If you've lacked any classes in humanities, and all you are is an engineer, eh, trust me, you're not going to be very liberal. No, nope, you are not. Well, let's get to our break. And when we come back, we'll go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, something old, something new. Searching by USC Film School Buds, co-writers, and director-producer duo Anish Chiganti and Sev Ohanian is a strange yet appealing beast. 
The audience sees the entire film through various screens, screens from computers, phones, security cams, etc. We watch conversations take place in FaceTime, in emails, and in chat messages, and the excitement of the chase is taken over by the excitement of the click. However, Searching is not a movie about technology. It's not a movie about social media. It's an even-handed thriller about a man who loses connection with his teenage daughter after the death of his wife, her mother, and then physically loses his daughter when she goes missing. That's because Giganti and Ohanian aren't interested in making gimmick films. In fact, when production company Bezelyevs pitched them this, their first feature film, looking to follow the footsteps of 2014's Unfriended, Giganti turned them down. That's because Chiganti and Ohanian want to make films that emotionally move people. And Searching does so through three vehicles. An opening that approaches the opening of Pixar's Up, the quiet, solid acting job of Michelle Law, and the film's anchorman John Cho, whose face is just a map to a world of feelings. But here's the thing. Even though our protagonist's family is played by Cho, Law, and Joseph Lee as brother-slash-uncle, Searching is not a film about being Asian, either. It's a thriller about a middle-class American family, and guess what? For once, that family isn't white. And while we need films that celebrate cultural difference, performing artists of color have said for years that they are not summed up by the fact that they are not white. And Searching is a testament to the fact that movies like this that almost always feature white protagonists don't have to. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60-Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Homo sapiens are nowhere near the fastest runners in the animal kingdom. But what we lack in speed, we make up for in endurance. And we're specially equipped to go the distance. We've got bigger butt muscles than other primates. We lost most of our fur, too, and sprouted lots of sweat glands to help us cool off. Scientists believe our endurance running abilities began to appear 2 to 3 million years ago, around the time the genus Homo came about. And a new study suggests that a mutation in one key gene had something to do with it. The mutation in what's called the CMAH gene altered the types of sugar molecules that decorate the surfaces of every cell in our bodies, which in turn may have made our muscles less prone to fatigue. Researchers have now found that mice bred with that same mutation can run longer without tiring compared to regular mice. The mice with a gene alteration also logged more miles running on their wheels, apparently for fun and they had more capillaries in their back leg muscles, which would increase the delivery of nutrients and oxygen during endurance exercise. The complete stats are in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. It's unclear if this small genetic tweak endows humans with the same benefits as the mice, but if it does, it could help explain how early humans got a leg up on their competitors. Or really, two legs. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This is an important message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. After a storm or disaster, it's important to eat only safe food. Throw away perishables like meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and leftovers stored above 40 degrees Fahrenheit for two hours or more. Throw away food with an unusual odor, color, or texture. Throw away food that may have come in contact with flood water, including food in swollen, punctured, and damaged cans. When in doubt, throw it out. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. 
I'm Mark Gage. The Roman Republic inspired and informed the American founders' own thinking about government. The lessons they learned from the Roman Republic helped them create the U.S. Constitution, with its separation of powers, checks and balances, and other structures designed to limit too much power being placed in the hands of one person, an elite group of people, or even a majority. The Roman Republic began about 500 B.C. and lasted until 27 A.D. This republic had no written constitution, changed over time, and was complicated in its details. However, its essential structure was as follows. At the top, there were the consuls. These two men wielded all executive power and controlled the army. Both had to agree in order to take any action. Second, there were the senators. They held their posts for life. Roman senators were men from wealthy families who advised the consuls. Initially, the Roman Senate had about 300 members, but its size varied over the years. Third, there were the Roman legislative assemblies. The Roman assemblies included all free male Roman citizens. They voted on major issues, but the rich patricians had more votes than the poor plebeians, or commoners. Assemblymen elected tribunes to the Senate who were supposed to speak for the poor. Finally, there were prefects, who had limited authority over military or civil matters. Prefectus Urbi, for example, were appointed officials who ran Rome in the absence of consuls, enforced the laws, and heard some court cases. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. You can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of NetRootsRadio.com. Joseph Wood, a double murderer, while on death row, sued the state of Arizona to learn about the drugs that the state planned to use to kill him. He lost. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. At his execution in 2014, Wood, for two hours, snorted and gasped for air while 15 rounds, 15 rounds of drugs were administered to him. He finally died. The First Amendment Coalition picked up Wood's lawsuit, claiming that the public has a right to witness all steps in an execution and know about the execution drugs and the qualifications of the employees administering them. On September 12th, the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals heard the case. Much of the oral argument focused on the executioners cutting off the microphones so no one could hear what was happening while the drugs were being prepared for injection and when the IV was being inserted. Although Arizona has not executed a prisoner since the debacle of the execution of Joseph Wood, there still remain on death row in that state 117 inmates, 114 male and 3 female. Leave aside for a moment, if you can, the Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment and consider this matter from a First Amendment perspective. The result should be clear. After all, if the state is going to, with premeditation, kill people, we, the public, have a right to know what the government is doing in our name. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Monday, September 17th, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. The international labor movement has called on the G20 group of countries to focus on decent jobs and the future of work. The call came at a meeting of the G20 labor and employment ministers in Argentina in early September. The G20 is a group of governments which works internationally to address questions such as economic stability during crises, like the recession of 2008. It is paralleled by the L20, the Labor 20. I talked to Pierre Abba about the L20 and its call for decent work. Mr. Abba is the General Secretary of the Trade Union Advisory Committee of the OECD. I asked him first to describe the L20. The L20 is the voice of trade unions at the G20. It was formally created in 2011 
There are other stakeholder groups that engage with the G20. There's the B20, which represents the business group. There's the, the C20 for civil society. It's a forum that is coordinated by the ITUC, the International Trading Confederation, and the TUAC, obviously in close partnership with the unions from the G20 countries, as well as the unions of the country holding the presidency. So what's it about? It's about work to access the, uh, the ministerials of the G20 and the summit of the head of states, and among the ministerial, the employment ministerials. But it's not only about bringing our voice to the ministerial and summits. It's also about participating in the many working groups because the G20 is a process. Over a full year, there are perhaps a good dozen of forums of working groups that are set up by the G20 countries, including a working group on employment. And the L20 has a mission here. We have to work to have access to the group, the agenda, what is being discussed, so ensure that our voice is being heard. At the meeting of the G20 Labor and Employment Ministers, the issue of the future of work was raised. Can you tell us a bit about the discussion? The future of work is a broad term that is used to address all the employment and labor challenges associated with digital transformation and the combination of digitization and globalization. There is obviously a quantitative aspect to that conversation. Where are the new jobs to be created? It is not the first time and I guess it's not the, the last time that the labor movement will have to face a, such a technological change, a, te- a technological leap. We have faced these changes in the past. What characterizes this digital transformation, and that's why there's so much conversation around this future work uh, term, is that when you combine digitalization with globalization, well, it does pose not only quantitative issues, but also qualitative aspects, because with digitalization, in many instances, you allow employers to keep control of workers, keep control, to keep supervision of workers via data exploitation, but at arm's length. And hence, digitalization, to a large extent, allow employers to, so to speak, to escape their employer responsibilities. The most obvious example is the rise of officially called non-standard forms of work, all the new forms of precarious jobs, the rise of platform economy, whereby workers are contractually not considered as employees with all the rights that go with it, although economically they are dependent on employers. So essential that we engage into this conversation on the future of work. Clearly, we have the tool for that, uh, support labor market institutions, support the right for workers to collective bargaining, to freedom of association allow them to be informed, access to skills and safety nets. But beyond that, we have to be very clear with governments that digital transformation and globalization allow for new business model to be disruptive and to challenge existing regulations on tax, on data privacy, on competition, and indeed on employment. So the quantitative aspect of digital transformation is a big issue we need to address through social dialogue, the qualitative aspects is also essential because as it looks right now, digitalization offers new opportunities for employers to outsource, new opportunities for business to escape their employer responsibilities. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From United Nations headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. The Trump administration is subjecting America's refugee resettlement program to bureaucratic strangulation. That's the charge coming from campaigners eager to see the U.S. continue to shelter large numbers of those fleeing war and violence around the world. To put things in perspective, as President Obama left office, he set an ambitious goal of admitting 115,000 refugees into the U.S. in 2017. President Trump immediately lowered that target to 50,000 in 2017 and 45,000 this year, though actual admissions will likely be far lower. Daniel Schneiderman is the deputy U.S. program director for the International Crisis Group. Admissions are going to be what I believe to be an all-time low for the program, especially in the post-9-11 world. I think we're going to end up somewhere around 21,000. The final number will come out at the end of the fiscal year, which is the end of September. Given that President Trump sets the refugee admissions target, he's often the only one capable of clearing bureaucratic roadblocks thrown up by various government agencies. 
But Schneiderman says Trump is doing the opposite. You certainly haven't seen an interest in trying to overcome the bureaucratic hurdles that have arisen in getting the program to be effective. It's quite the contrary. We spoke to someone who said that every time there's a bureaucratic problem that arises or a security check that causing problems, you know, the the administration is tickled pink. Schneiderman regrets the U.S. scaling back its moral leadership on refugee policy, but says undermining global refugee goals has strategic consequences, too, making it harder for America's allies in the Middle East to convince refugee-wary populations they've got things under control. What incentive does the Turkish government have to take in Syrian refugees if there isn't a vibrant and strong U.N. refugee resettlement program that the U.S. is helping to facilitate? So these kinds of decisions to spin down a program, irrespective of the nasty rhetoric that you see coming out of the administration and some, at least some parts of it, they have broader strategic implications for how refugees are treated around the world. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 42 degrees. What? Are we getting into fall already? Well, we are forecast to be a bit warmer than we were yesterday, slated for, well, a high of 77, 78. We were around 74 yesterday. Not too bad. This is our, I guess, can we say Indian summer? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, we are experiencing that, and the angle of the sun is such that uh, it's it's nice. It's nice out. Uh, a nice uh, respite from the terrible heat of summer, and now... I feel like we're experiencing a nice part of summer, and it's fall. Indeed. Partly cloudy uh, throughout the day. Winds are a negligible one mile per hour out of the north. They will then shift out of the north-northwest in a couple of hours at 5 to 10 miles per hour, uh, continuing out of that direction through the evening, and then we will shift then out of the north, continuing that clip into the morning. A uh, small chance of precipitation tonight and tomorrow, increasing uh, as the day goes as the days go on as we get closer towards the weekend. Hopefully, we'll have a tad of rain. It would be good. Ragweed pollen is uh, moderate. Uh, the air quality index is good at 32 parts per million, and that uh, daytime UV index has dropped down into moderate at four. I haven't seen that. Just means the angle of the sun, folks, is not going to burn you up as much. Pressure is holding steady at 30.31 inches. Visibility is down to 7 miles. And relative humidity is 95%. Well, 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 it's going to be a little warm and muggy. My. All right, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 77 degrees and sunny. Paris is 83 degrees and sunny. Rome is 83 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 68 and fair. Kabul is 73 degrees and fair. Hong Kong, 77 with light rain. Tokyo is 72 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 55 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 74 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is... Weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. For 
first article here up at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays is out of uh, Share Blue Media by Tommy Christopher. Now, Devin Nunez accepted an award from a notorious anti-Muslim hate group, and he also used his acceptance speech to push his favorite lies about the Russia probe. Wow, how many rubles are in his pocket? Yes. Uh, Nunez can't seem to find time for his own constituents, but he did find uh, time this week to accept an award from a group that the Southern Poverty Law Center has officially designated as a hate group. On Thursday, Nunez spoke at a dinner honoring him as the 2018 Keeper of the Flame, an honor bestowed upon him by the extremist anti-Muslim group The Center for Security Policy. The Southern Poverty Law Center notes that the organization is a conspiracy-oriented mouthpiece for the growing anti-Muslim movement in the United States. The group's founder, Frank Gaffney Jr., has hosted white supremacist Jared Taylor on his radio show. Now, Gaffney is also a grifter. I just wish I had the business acumen, which means the lack of complete moral structure, a complete lack of ethics and morality in that lack of a moral structure. And I think I could make a lot of money just like Gaffney. Well, darn it. We're liberals. Jeez. Nunez also used his acceptance speech to push his favorite lies about the Russia investigation. Nunez told the crowd, We knew that the dossier, the dirt, and the fake news stories made up the bulk of the FISA warrant. Nunez claims that when the FBI petitioned a judge for a warrant to start surveillance on a Trump campaign staffer, it did so for partisan reasons and with little evidence. But every document released so far in relation to that re- warrant has refuted Nunez's claims. I See, he's playing to a group of people. Now, of course, the people in this anti-Muslim group, they really don't care what the facts are either. They just want to hate Muslims and, you know, perpetuate some mistaken belief about what America is. Okay. Uh, So it's not easy to get a FISA warrant. Okay. Let's be clear about that. He makes it sound like, oh, all you have to do is go in there and, you know, you can convince a judge. Oh, yeah, we'll do it for partisan reasons. Yeah, right. Uh, Nunez also predicted that if he succeeds in declassifying more documents related to the Russia investigation, Democrats and the media will be frightened by what they see. The Department of Justice and the FBI are alarmed, but not by Nunez's wild conspiracy theorizing. The agencies have consistently warned that the documents Nunez wants to release contain sensitive information whose release could harm national security. What that means is that people are going to die. He's going to out our assets, our undercover uh, uh, confidential sources. These people die. He wants them named. And given Nunez's embarrassing track record, there's no reason to think he'll find anything new to reveal. Nunez and Republicans spent several weeks in January hyping a memo about the FISA application that was supposed to contain bombshell revelations about the FBI being biased against Trump. But when the memo was finally released in early February, it was an embarrassing failure that actually debunked the GOP's attacks on the Russia probe. In July... Heavily redacted materials related to the warrant application were released, and those documents showed even more conclusively that Nunez's attacks on the Russia investigation were all lies. Nunez has not held an open town hall since 2010, yet he somehow found time to spew lies to a hate group this week. That's a message that his constituents are sure to hear. Loud and clear. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, 
resté toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Finishing up here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article out of Think Progress by Danielle McLean. A U.S. Customs and Border Protection supervisor was arrested Saturday after he confessed to driving four women to desolate highway areas in and around Laredo, Texas, where he was stationed, and executing them all with a handgun. Authorities described Juan David Ortiz, a Navy veteran who joined Border Patrol a decade ago, as a serial killer who preyed on sex workers he picked up at Laredo area bus stops and parking lots. His victims included a transgender woman. Ortiz, age 35, was hired after the CBP relaxed its hiring standards following the 9-11 terrorist attacks which officials say allowed bad actors to join his ranks, according to a report. He is the second Customs and Border Protection agent from the Laredo sector to be accused of mass murders this year. Another supervisor from the sector, Ronald Anthony Burgos Avilas, was arrested in April on two capital murder charges after he was accused of killing his 27-year-old romantic partner and their one-year-old child. Wow. Only the best. Officials say Ortiz, who is married and has children, shot the victims with a handgun in the head or face while he was off duty between September 3rd and September 15th. One of the bodies was found behind a gravel pit along the highway. And Melissa Ramirez and Claudine and Loera were among the victims. The others have not yet been identified. A fifth victim was able to escape from Ortiz after he stopped his pickup truck at a gas station and pointed his gun at her. Ortiz had driven the woman to a gas station a few few blocks away from a Customs and Border Patrol facility and pointed his pistol at her. The victim was subsequently able to escape from his grasp by removing her shirt, at which point she tracked down a state trooper for assistance. Ortiz was found hiding out in the bed of his truck in a hotel parking garage, where he was then arrested and charged. Well, this is a terrible indictment on the Customs and Border Patrol. Uh, They are obviously not vetting these people. And let's be clear. When they talk about, uh, you know, the... uh, the vetting process being weakened after 9-11. Let's not forget, okay? We need to remember who was running the show at that point and why that vetting process was weakened. Yeah, G.W. Bush. Let's not forget about him and the rest of his crime syndicate. We used to make the joke. Oh, yeah, let's see. There was Bill Clinton... And then there was Obama, G.W. Bush. Never heard about him. Who's he? Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But uh, Netroots Radio will broadcast on throughout the day. For all that breaking news, we'll visit with you tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all that breaking news. And we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert. Dans tel et des des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière.
en mon nouvel Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 